childhood obesity and adult disease risk by Inez Anchando, Pam Estes, and Ellen Satter. I'm Carol Danaher, board president of the Ellen Satter Institute and public health nutritionist in Santa Clara County, California. The Ellen Satter Institute is a not-for-profit organization. The Institute devotes itself to passing on the legacy of Ellen Satter's feeding dynamics and eating confidence models through education, training, and research. In short, we take the stress out of feeding and put the joy back in eating. We hope you find today's webinar helpful and will help us cover the technology costs associated with these webinars by making a tax-deductible donation on our website at ellensatterinstitute.org. You can find a Donate tab on the home page. I wish to thank Ellen and Inez for donating their time and expertise today as they define and examine the role of rapid early infant growth in the development of obesity and its implications for clinicians, researchers, and parents. Part two is next Thursday, February 28th. Most of you are familiar with our first speaker, Ellen Satter. She is an internationally recognized authority on eating and feeding. Dr. Inez Anchando counsels children and parents and conducts research at the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in El Paso, Texas. She is a clinical faculty member of the Ellen Satter Institute. Your certificate of participation will be available after next week's webinar. Ellen, I'm going to turn this over to you now. Thank you, Carol. I have um, I put a little delay in there because it took a while for me to catch up with what you are showing. Um, how about it, committee? Can you see my screen? Silence. How about it, Inez? Can you see yes. my screen? Okay. Hi, everybody. Yes, Ellen. We can yes. see you. Yes, thank you. Well, Inez is in Texas, and I'm in Wisconsin, but we are a team today. Carol's in California, um, and later on you're going to hear Craig. He's, been, he's in Wisconsin as well. So hi, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, we're so pleased to have you here for this webinar. Um, a principle of the Satter Feeding Dynamics model is that infants are best served when they're supported in eating according to their internal regulators of hunger and fullness and growing in a way that is right for them, whether that is growing rapidly or growing slowly. However, as you know, uh, which I think is the reason that you're here today, a great deal of current research questions that principle by suggesting that infants and children who show rapid early weight gain are predisposed to negative outcomes in later life. <clears throat> in essence, the research suggests that children can't be trusted to grow in a way that's right for them. Inez Anchando examines that literature and the feeding dynamics principle. And as you should have the keyboard and mouse. Yeah. Thank you so much for um, coming today. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. And let's begin by looking at the objectives. And these are the four objectives that we're going to uh, talk about today. We'll um, explain what is rapid early weight gain. We'll also look at the relationship between rapid early infant weight gain in adult disease, insulin resistance, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease. And we are also then talk about the implications of this body of research for the clinician, the researcher, and the parent. Uh, Ellen will cover objective number three. She will show and tell with the CDC growth charts in the graphs, um, z-score graphs, um, what we're talking about. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, but before we start with Ellen, um, I will tell you how I became interested in this topic. I am fascinated on the topic of weight in children and weight in children. I got even more interested in this topic in the summer of 2009 after hearing a presentation about it by Ellen Demerat 
Of course, before I had always kind of wonder, what is it about early weight, including early weight gain and birth weight, and what is the connection about these and adult disease? That was my question. So I started asking people around. At the time, I also heard a podcast. At least I think it was a podcast. Maybe it was a radio program where Deborah Crummel was interviewed, and she mentioned the link between early weight and adult disease. Then I decided to do something about it. Ellen and I talked about it and began in earnest to look at the literature. Then, to make it more formal, I applied to give a talk at FENCI 2010, and maybe some of you attended. Um, I also asked Pam Estes, who will present next week, if she wanted to do this with me, and she said yes. And so we started working on putting together the talk. After FENCI 2010, I wrote a family meals focus with Ellen about the topic, early weight gain and its consequences, and it is available in the website. I know and now I'm very excited to present this webinar with this updated material. But um, I'll give you another um, quick pre-presentation information. There are two, probably you already have seen them, two different um, um, handouts that we put together for you. One is a table with the articles and the other is the annotated reference list. And um, the annotated reference list is more complete because it includes the articles that are um, described in the table where we um, talk about the definition of a rapid early weight gain. Um, the table is color coded and I won't tell you um, what the description is, but you'll discover it as you go, as we go along. So, let's begin with the definition of rapid early infant weight gain. Um, you can see there are, there have been several definitions. Um, this chart presents the information on exactly that. It answers the question, how is early weight gain defined? It, in 1970, first attempted to define it as weight for age at or over the 90th percentile at this at, at three different times, six weeks, three months, and six months of age. Then Ong conducted a systematic review of 21 articles. It was actually Ong and Luz who did that. And um, defined rapid early weight gain as an increase in 0.67 z-scores in weight for age at birth, two years, and five years of age. This 0.67 represents the gap between percentiles in the growth charts. Then Stettler defined it two different ways. In 2003, with a group of African Americans, it um, studied um, early infant weight gain, define it as one or at, in, uh, at or one, sorry, increase of weight for a z-score at four months of age, 12 months, and seven years of age. Then in 2005, with a group of, um, described as U European Americans children, um, defined it as a change in weight for age z-score between eight days in 112 days of age. So about a week to about three months of age. Then by year, conducted a study of 24, another systematic review of 24 studies on infant size and growth and risk of obesity. 18 of those studies investigated the relationship between infant size and obesity afterwards. And understandably, the definition varied um, and that it was a weight for age increase over the 90th percentile and uh, one z-score and a half z-score, so it was, it was different. And the time framing was three months and two years of age. Then the last one comes from Stettler's, uh, sorry, Lunison, is from a group of researchers in the Netherlands that conducted a few, several studies to try to understand more about infant size and growth and also risk for disease later on in life in adulthood. And um, he defined it initially in his study, it was defined as a, an increase of one z-score weight for age in the first year of life. And then um, sort of moved the goalpost and defined it as a half a z-score 
in the first three months of life, so from zero to three months of life. Now, to put things in, con in context for you, um, let me show you. This is, I, I'm assuming a lot of you have seen this, and this is a normal curve or bell graph. And the growth charts are based on this. Um, they are adjusted for all of the different uh, numbers, but this is the basis of that. And so just to, um, again, put things in context, this is the mean, so zero z-scores or standard deviations, and then this is where the 95th and the 97th percentile are between the 1.5 and 2 z-scores. And then on the other side of the curve, we have the 5 and the 3rd percentile, and here are at the minus 1.5 and the minus 0.2 z-scores. So that gives you an idea of where we are. So now, Ellen is going to take it from here, uh, and again, as I mentioned to you, she's going to show you and tell you what it looks like, what early infant weight gain looks like in CDC growth charts and C-scores graphs. Ellen. Thank you, Inez. Um, to help us make sense of these definitions that Inez is giving us, let's apply them to some actual growth charts. Adele, and first of all, I'm going to pull out the two that relate to percentile. Here's the eyed one, and here is the beard one that Ines just talked about. Adele achieved the high percentiles that were described as problematic by these two authors. And you see that she started out uh, somewhere around the 10th percentile, and by the time she was nine months old, she was up to the 95th percentile. So that's two, she, um, she qualifies by two definitions. And then we convert to z-score, and here's what Adele's growth looks like when you put it on a z-score for age um, chart. Now, you know, this, this is uh, from uh, minus 1.5 up to plus 2, and Adele's um, weight for age increased by quite a bit. And if we look at the definition of weight for age z-score between 8 days and 112 days, well, here we are, a little over 8 days, let's see, 112 days, that would be about 3, 4 months, and so, yes, she definitely increased by she increased, and she increased by 0.5, she increased by 0.67, and she increased by 1.0. Uh, in all these age des designations, now obviously we don't have her at five and seven years, but up until then, this little kid was growing like gangbusters. And so if we just look at this one, uh, one uh, weight for age z-score, increase at four months, so let's go four months, so here she is at plus 0.5, and she went up from minus 1.5, so that's actually a two uh, increase in weight for HC scores. Is that the way they're defining it? They're, they say by four months or at 12 months in this? Which is it? It is exactly at four months. Okay, so if it's from birth to four months, then that's what they're going by. All right, so to help you get your C legs with reading these C-score charts, um, I'm going to pull Inez's bell curve back in here and just show you and putting these fingers, figures on the bell curve. So here uh, Adele is at minus 1.5, and that's where she is on the bell curve. By the time we get her at say 12 months of age, no, 9 months of age, she is almost at 2, so she's way up here. So this little kid grew from here to here in the first 9 months of age. She was growing very rapidly. Marin, using the same designators, doesn't qualify as uh, for being obese, um, according to her percentile curves. Um, and converting her weight for age uh, data to z-scores uh, shows that she is at risk, however, by all the other definitions. Now, I want to call your attention to the fact that this vertical axis is calibrated differently. Their curves look pretty much the same, but actually with Mari, it goes from minus 1 
up to plus 1. And remember with Adele it was minus 1.5 up to 2, so quite a, quite a different range. But she had an increase in Z-score between 8 days and 112 days of age of a point more than 0.5. So here she is at 0.1 up to plus um, 5. So, you know, it's actually 1.5. So obviously she qualifies on these um, parameters as well. <coughs> Here is Chris, who does not qualify for the obesity designation, and his growth chart looks pretty smooth. But converting it to a z-score gives a different picture. He crossed over one z-score between 12 and 36 months. So here he is. He's 12 months. See, he's perking along at uh, from minus 5 up to... Um, zero. So actually, he'd qualify on this one, wouldn't he? Uh, in S, and he did have a weight for age score between eight and 112, or uh, eight and 112 days of age, and then um, and so he he does qualify on these parameters, but he really qualifies here where his Z score really took off. So here we have a minus 0.5. And all the way up to um, a plus one, and so it's not even as extreme as Mari as Adele, but Mari and Adele, but quite a different pattern because he he was growing smoothly and then he took off like gangbusters. Um, again, uh, here's another child. Her percentile plotting doesn't qualify her for a diagnosis of obesity, but her growth curve looks kind of fishy. It shows uh, such abrupt, abrupt shifts. And these shifts are even more apparent on the z-score chart. Her upward shift of 1.5 z-score, here she is, she's minus 0.5 and she goes up to 1. So that's a 1.5 z-score shift um, qualifies her for 2 of the four risk designations here and here. She didn't have an increase in the first three months. Uh, she actually had a decrease, which is worrisome. Um, and she, what's the other one? Uh, and, and she didn't have, yeah, she, there, was no, there was no shift uh, at those early months. Um, these abrupt shifts in weight raise the possibility that this is weight acceleration brought about by some disruption in Chandra's biopsychosocial milieu. Next week, I'm going to piggyback on Pam Estes' presentation to give you more of the backstory about these children. So thank you, Inez. Back to you. Okay, thank you so much, Ellen. That was very helpful. There, I want to address this that I should have addressed before. Uh, we do take questions, and we encourage you to ask the questions that come to your mind as the presentation is going on, because then that will give us an idea. And we'll also have questions. We'll have questions at the end, of course, hopefully about 10 minutes of questions. Uh, but if not, you can always go back to our forum. And um, the address is www.clinis, that is C-L-I-N-I-S-S dot B-B three host dot com. Uh, I, can ask, I can answer a couple of the questions. We will not um, be using the WHO growth curves because none of the research has used it. I want to, it's a good idea and I like maybe to do it in the future, but well, we won't do it because the researcher doesn't do it. Um, we wanted to keep um, that uniformity there. And I, um, I hope we've answered the question about what a z-score is, which is just a standard deviation. Um, and um, thank you so much for those questions. So now, let's begin with what we're going to be doing here. Um, so these are 
uh, this is the topic at hand. And the question is, what is the literature saying about the relationship between early weight gain and adult disease? And this, these are the diseases, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, insulin resistance, and I know obesity is not a disease, but um, it's included. Now, when we started preparing this, um, we, we were we kind of got very excited and ambitious and thought we can cover all of these, but um, obviously doesn't fit in this presentation, but I will also be um, in next week's presentation with Pam Estes for a few minutes at the beginning. So let's go ahead and start with it. Um, there are 10 articles that we're going to review in this first part of the presentation with cardiovascular disease and high blood pressure, just to give you a heads up on what's coming. Uh, the first study is by Lou Neeson. And again, as I mentioned to you, this is a study from the people from the Netherlands. The initial group was 217 infants. And they followed them from 0 to 18 to 24 years of age. Um, and looked for what was the association between rapid weight gain in the first year of life and cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes mellitus uh, in adulthood. From um, these 217 original sample, 87 of these babies gained more um, or equal to um, 0.67 standard deviations or z-scores weight gain in the first year of life. 54 of these babies were small for gestational age. So once they came up with this first group, then they subdivided it into those infants that experienced an increase of a half z-score increase in the first three months of life. And there were 65 of those babies. So they called those rapid growth babies. And the results showed that the higher the weight gain in the first three months of life, the lower the insulin sensitivity, the lower the HDL, and the higher percentage of body fat and more central adiposity. As I mentioned to you, what, what is puzzling about this study is that 54 of, of these babies were small for gestational age. And so there is the dilemma of thinking that catch-up growth can be problematic or controversial. Then Kajanti, the second study, studied the Helsinki birth cohort study of about 2,000 men and women from birth to the mean age of 62 years. So this was a very involved study with 11 measurements between birth and two years of age. And um, they, they went at it from a kind of a different perspective. They, they investigated whether small body size at birth and slow growth, so not higher, but slow growth during first, the first two years of life was associated in any way with cardiovascular disease and stroke in adult life. The results showed low BMI at birth associated with higher LDL and VLDL. Lower BMI at six months of age was associated with lower values of HDL cholesterol and higher values of LDL, VLDL, etc. And then low BMI at two years was associated with higher triglycerides. NASMI looked at CRP because chronically elevated levels predict cardiovascular outcomes. This was in a rather large cohort of almost 6,000 individuals who were followed at eight different periods of time between 1982 to 2004. And in 2004 and 2005, about 89 percent of the total sample was um, available to measure CRP levels. Results showed weight gain in infancy, infancy, sorry, showed weak negative association in males. But after two years of age in males, then CRP levels and weight gain was correlated. Whereas in females, weight gain during all of the different periods associated with higher levels of CRP. Going back to um, the previous century. This research is interesting, um, only because um, Jarvelin was one of the first ones that described what catch-up weight is, what we know today as catch-up weight. He actually called it catch-up in weight. And um, what he did is his research demonstrated that early fast weight gain associated with, blood, with higher blood pressure later in life, an increase of 0.67 z-scores from birth to one year of age was associated with elevated systolic 
not diastolic, but systolic blood pressure at 31 years of age. Eklund came up with very similar results, um, show that high weight gain between zero and six months of life was associated with high blood pressure at 17 years of age. And the definition of early weight gain was a change in weight for age Z score between zero and six months of age. Then Adair, using this very large number of five birth cohorts from Brazil, Guatemala, Guatemala India, Philippines, and South Africa, um, studied whether early weight gain was associated with um, high blood pressure later in life. He, this study is interesting for several reasons. Uh, first of all, the, the, the measurements went over uh, the first year of life. Um, they measure at 0, 12, 24, 48, 48, and then adulthood. And so um, there's quite a lot of measurements there. But they also use conditional weight. And what they did is, um, defined it as uh, all the expected weight gain based on prior weights. And, and so that's kind of a different way of defining how weight uh, moves around. The, the results show that when there was no adjustment for adult height, there was an association between high blood pressure and weight gain in infants in childhood. But once it was adjusted, the data was adjusted for adult height, this was not present. We go back to the Lunison study that I mentioned to you, that I mentioned already to you twice, and um, his results show that there was no relationship between rapid early weight gain and blood pressure at 21 years of age. And Law found about the same results in a group of 346 British individuals from birth, followed from birth to, 24, to 20 years of age with 11 measurements done between birth and 10 years of age. Um, so he found there was no association but between weight gain in infancy and blood pressure at 22 years of age, but there was an association with the combination of lower birth weight and faster weight gain between one and five years of age and higher adult systolic blood pressure. Barker is the one from the Barker hypothesis, and he showed that there was an association between low birth weight and high cardiovascular disease risk later in life. The explanation for this given by um, this researcher was that after birth, small for gestational age babies experience rapid weight gain due specifically to high caloric feedings. And so this was what um, was known as the Barker hypothesis. And so he showed that, that there was an increased risk, um, especially in low birth weight babies. Then Singal, um, and I will talk a little bit more about another study of Singal that is very interesting. Um, he found that um, Looking at the association between being born small for gestational age and having high blood pressure, and did it in a group of 153 children and followed them and then compared it to weight um, at six to eight years of age. And um, he's done several studies looking at those children that have received enriched formulas. In this case, they were ba they, half of the babies were receiving as uh, an enriched formula, formula with 28% more protein and the other ones um, standard formula. And the results show that children, children receiving the higher protein formula had higher diastolic and average blood, blood pressure, in, but not systolic. Now, in, in this study, the size of the effect between the two group groups was three millimeters of mercury. And the authors make the case that a reduction of two millimeters of mercury will decrease cardiovascular deaths by about 100,000. But it is not mentioned that this is calculated for adults diagnosed with high blood pressure. Now this is the last study we're going to review in this section um, of cardiovascular disease and blood pressure and the association with early infant weight gain. And um, Kirchhoff is part of the group of Lunisin, the ones that um, look at, they are from the Netherlands, and um, what he did is took a group of 406 individuals 
from birth to 18 to 24 years of age, of age and looked at the effect of small for gestational age, inappropriate for gestational age, and short stature. And um, he found that there was an association with all of these values, systolic blood pressure, pulse pressure, and diastolic blood pressure, and concluding that these babies then had a high risk of um, cardiovascular disease. However, once the data was adjusted for heart rate, the association was not uh, present. So we are um, at the end of this um, of this section. Yes, Inez. So now I've I've been listening uh, to these uh, numbers and conclusions, and. I, I do need some help from you, and that is what is the take-home message from all of this with respect to cardiovascular disease and high blood pressure? Well, there is evidence by, shown by Charlene and Eklund that, as I mentioned, that there is an association between high blood, uh, fast, rapid early weight gain and um, high blood pressure, for instance, of cardiovascular disease or risk of cardiovascular disease. But Lumisen and Law and Adair come up with different results once the data is adjusted for heart rate, for adult height, or for gestational age. And so um, there are methodological issues that make it very difficult to try to compare these studies. And I will mention just one right now that because it's pertinent to what we're doing. Um, in one of these, so the topic that we are right now, and um, so the, the fact that the blood pressure has been measured with an automated device. These devices accurately measure mean blood, mean blood pressure, but the systolic and diastolic values are assigned from a proprietary algorithm. If this algorithm incorporates heart rate, then the statistical differences shown may be a result of the algorithm and not of actual blood pressure differences. So there may be, you know, uh, again, methodological issues that um, need to be addressed for us to be able to make more sense of what happens. So well, the studies kind of compare apples and oranges. A, a bit like that, a bit. You yeah. know, it's uncertain how, how that is. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. And um, I'm glad um, everyone's still here. Um, somebody asked a question about um, how can they um, calculate z-scores, and, and uh, Ellen has information on that, and she'll tell you about it um, at the end. We do have an answer. Um, let me keep on going here. Let me, I'm sorry, I have a little bit of a delay here, but it's coming. So um, we're going to talk about now about the rapid early infant weight gain and insulin resistance, and if we go back to this Lunison study, and um, if this is a group, I remind you, of these 87 babies that gain more or equal to one z-score from zero to one year of age, and then, uh, then they were divided into those ones that gained half a z-score between zero and three months of, of age, and we have 57 of those babies, um, sorry, 65 of those babies. Um, 54 of those were small for gestational age. And he found that there was an association with a decreased insulin sensitivity in these babies, so um, as adults. And now Erickson has two different studies that are um, interesting. In, in 2003, studied a large sample of, and I'm talking really large, almost 8,800 individuals born in Helsinki between 1934 and 1944, and then follow them with details, me, detailed measurements eight times between birth and one year of age and ten times between one and twelve years of age. And specifically, results show that for low birth weight babies, those, those less than 3.5 kilos, the rate of infant growth was not related to type 2 diabetes mellitus. But among babies born with birth weights for, of more than 3.5 kilos, slow growth in length in this sample between birth and three months of age predicted type 2 diabetes mellitus at over 40 years of age. Then in 2006, Erickson studied a group of 
of this as kind of a subgroup of sub subgroup of this sample, 2,003 individuals with more measurements, um, 11 measurements between birth and two years of age, and seven measurements between two and 11 years of age. Glucose tolerance was assessed in adulthood, and in this sample, 311 individuals with type 2 diabetes were diagnosed at that time, and 496 with um, were diagnosed with impaired glucose tolerance. In both of the cases of type 2 diabetes mellitus and impaired glucose tolerance diagnosis, it was associated with low weight gain between birth and two years of age. We go back to this Kirchhoff study that I mentioned to you. This is part of the um, group from the Netherlands of Lunisen. And um, he, f he found, okay, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Uh, I'm going to have to skip this first study. I, I went with the flow, but because this was discussed before, um, so we will continue with Norris. And Norris studied the association between diabetes mellitus risk factors and birth weight and weight between 24 to 48 months of age. And the results showed the lower birth weight and accelerated weight gain after 48 months of age, so not in infancy, not between zero and one year of age, um, associated with insulin resistance, a known risk factor for diabetes mellitus. Norris used a large sample um, of a cohort, that cohort that I mentioned to you before, from Brazil, Guatemala, India, and the Philippines, and South Africa, measured birth weight, weight at 24 and at 48 months, and also used conditional, conditional weight the expected weight given the prior weights, as I mentioned. Now, Fabricius studied risk factors for type 2 diabetes mellitus, including early weight and length gain, and let, sorry, length gain. And he showed that small for gestational age babies with rapid early weight gain showed glucose intolerance in adolescents. This was, but this was not, this did not happen for appropriate for gestational age babies, even if they had rapid early weight gain. Now, in this next, this next study I'm going to take a little bit more time with, and I'll tell you a story um, that associates with it. Um, Singal studied fasting 32-33 split pro-insulin concentration, which is strongly associated with the development of later non-insulin dependent diabetes. It is a marker of insulin resistance, and so the, low, the lower the better. And he studied this in three groups of babies, 106 preterm babies who received an enriched formula that had more protein, more fat, and more vitamins, zinc, and copper and then 110 preterm babies who received lower nutrient and rich formula, and then a control group of 61 babies. And it's unclear what diet they received these babies, maybe some breast milk and some formula. And then compare it to themselves at 13 to 16 years of age. And the results showed that preemies who were fed and rich formula in healthy term born control group babies had higher, almost 21% higher, 32-33 split pro insulin concentration compared to the group of babies who received the regular non-enriched formula. Now, this study prompted a letter to the editor by Melissa Young, who later also wrote her own article about early weight gain. She argued that Singal et al. were almost proposing not to have these small for gestational age children achieve catch-up growth. In fact, this is exactly what Dr. Young said. Singal et al. proposed that early postnatal undernutrition in children, well, sorry, born preterm, could have a beneficial effect on insulin resistance later in life. And of course, um, Singal came back and responded and said, "That's not the issue. We're we're trying to tell you that we are the first randomized controlled trial that has done this, and we show these are our results." And um, the interesting aspect of all of this is what she was arguing, which is very um, valid, but uh, in, in, in my opinion, it was even more interesting the methodology. So my story is that I contacted um, Singal, and I asked him um, several questions about the methodology. I was I was kind of surprised at the very high attrition rate. Um, the dropout rate was 
you know, maybe a hundred from one group, and and so I, I was questioning that, and and also he describes something called balance addition, and you know, it's it's a kind of a sophisticated way of evening out things so that it works out, and in particular, I wanted to know um, how could this study uh, had randomized breastfeeding babies, and his res his response came in one line. Breast babies were not randomized, and uh, this um, is interesting because once it, it is allowed that the parents choose behaviors that may influence exactly the behavior that you're trying to, to or variable that you're trying to control for, then it is is very difficult, you know, um, to continue to um, um, just maintain that. The, the study was randomized, so uh, this was a, a very promising study, I think. But um, this this issue is is important. Um, this is a study that is very small but very interesting because so far we've sort of assumed that any sort of believed that small for gestational age babies that go through catch up weight are the ones that have the highest risk of um, having insulin resistance or insulin sensitivity issues. However, this study by Woods showed that um, in 16 short small for gestational age babies and 7 short normal birth weight controls that had a very detailed investigation into glucose and growth hormone metabolism, hyperinsulinemia and insulin sensitivity, um, the results showed that both the short small for gestational age babies and the short normal birth weight controls had similar levels of the insulin like growth factor which reflects insulin resistance so they still had insulin resistance the next study by Bohors um, studied the relationship between birth weight high birth weight and low birth weight and insulin metabolism and whether catch up weight after two years of age and increased fat increased insulin resistance and risk of cardiovascular disease. The results show that high birth weight babies had higher adiponectin, which is a peptide hormone produced and secreted exclusively by fat cells and regulate it's believed to regulate glucose and fat metabolism, but also has anti-inflammatory effects on cells, linings of the walls of the blood vessels. So it showed that um, these babies had this higher adiponectin, which is a good thing, had insulin sensitivity and also lower insulin resistance, confirming that high birth weight does not automatically predispose to diabetes mellitus. Then the last study by Larn Kayer, who investigated the relationship between infant weight and body composition and appetite regulatory hormones, including ghrelin, leptin, and adiponectin, as well as insulin resistance at 17 years of age. The results show that weight gain from 0 to 3 months was related to body fat, which is kind of expected, ghrelin and adiponectin, but not to leptin or insulin resistance. So, in conclusion, sorry, this is not the conclusion, <laughs> but this is preliminary. Um, we know that the definition rapid weight gain is, is arbitrary. We also know that the outcomes and measures that were included in the studies were abnormal, but not were not abnormal, but mostly just chipped. It. So a lot of the studies talk about higher, um, but not abnormal uh, blood pressure, for instance. And then also some of the values are elevated, not the others. And then there is a fact that most studies are epidemiologically sorry epidemiological observational, which is appropriate. It, it's time now to to develop other studies or to look into other studies that um, can be can give us more results about it. That study by Singal was very promising, as I mentioned to you at the time. Um, there's also a lot of differences in in follow up of in, of age, three months, six months, one year, forty eight months, and the study populations vary. I'm sorry. I'm having, a, again, a little bit of delay here. 
Um, let me go back here. We, um, for the FNC presentation, uh, we talked about these two studies. We decided not to include them here because and it's not, I think it's not included in your handout because um, there's not enough time. So I apologize for including that. Now, um, this is a quote by um, Christopher Kimball, and I, I know a lot of you probably know um, him because he's so kind of famous. Famous. So this is from the January February 2013 issue of Cook, Cooks Illustrated. Now Christopher Kimball can be controversial. So he was, as he was in a recent article published in the New York Times about food, where he declared that cooking was difficult. And I know all this pretty much, his statement pretty much contradicts what is popular nowadays, that, and that the notion is that, you know, cooking is so easy and we can do it. So the analogy probably doesn't apply perfectly here, but in this, in this same way, I think, he's calling us to begin to think to think in terms of interpreting and doing nutrition research, research more carefully. Now that we're not doing it carefully, but we, we do need to work on interpreting um, um, better. And even further, what I, this quote um, represented for me was that we need to begin by losing what we think we know to be able to pay attention to what we need to concentrate on, which can be the very last thing we can expect or we've been expecting. This um, picture, probably some of you are familiar if you've been coming to our webinars, and we know that there's ample evidence that nature is the strongest determinant of size and shape, and that is um, genetics. This mother and child are very similar in shape, even though they're not the same skin color, but um, that's, that's what's there. So, what are, what are clinicians to do? In 1986, sorry, 1996, Ellen Satter published an article about internal regulation and weight. In this article, she first described the differences between the conventional model and Satter model approach to the problem of excess, excessive weight gain. The Satter model focuses on achieving eating competence with energy balance, identified whether there is abnormal growth, and evaluate specific individual issues that can be the cause of disruption and apply the division of responsibility. As I have today put in context for you what early weight gain is, uh, we hope that you come back next week to then hear how that applies to specific children, for example. I'm going to then conclude today with um, this next two slides. To recap, um, we know that then it is uncertain and inconsistent. What we know is the definition of rapid early weight gain. We know also that the time periods are varying. We also know that, very importantly, feeding dynamics is not included. And a lot of them, except the studies by Singal, what the baby eats is not even included. There are many methodological issues that need to be addressed, not the least of which is that Nutrition in small, in small for gestational age babies and low birth weights had to be considered linear growth in body composition and maybe even perhaps another measure of body compos composition as um, Dr. Irene Olson has been recommending and that's called the ponderal index and some of you probably use it already. And it's just not early weight gain but all of these other measures. Also, preterm babies have low subcutaneous tissue and high intra-abdominal intern, internal adipose tissue. And again, these are body composition issues that have to be considered. Um, there are changes in NICU practices that now have to be updated. Um, there are very small numbers of preterm infants and IUGR babies. Um, there's also the idea that we have very good quality, and, and um, but as as um, Irene Olsen again has shown, is not so. Um, the other, the last one is that we have the assumption that rapid early weight gain is maladaptive. So these babies are doing something they're not supposed to be doing when maybe it's absolutely required for survival. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Inez. You know, I, Winston Churchill said he was filled with the elation of uh, having been shot at and missed. I, I think that um, from what you're saying today is that we don't have to start trying to control baby's growth anytime soon. That's correct. Now, the evidence of absence is not absence of evidence. There you go. <laughs> we, we need to make sure that once, um, you know, again, this is why I concentrated on telling you that interpretation research is so important and is difficult, basically. It's not an easy task, but we, we need to make sure that our message does more good than harm. Yeah, thank you. Well, should we try to answer some questions? Okay, this is um, this is Carol, and I, um, Inez, I'd like to just give the closing remarks um, first, and, and remind folks that, um, and then we'll go on to questions uh, afterwards. But just quickly, thank you very much for this um, presentation, and it really lays the groundwork for uh, next week, same time on. February 28th, uh, your uh, certificate of attendance will be present at that time. And then I also want to remind you that um, uh, Ellen Satter Institute uh, provides these webinars uh, for you, and we would recommend a donation of $35 to help support our programming. Um, that said, even any amount, $10, $20, this all adds up. Um, and really does help us cover the uh, technology uh, costs cost associated uh, with providing these webinars. And all of your donations uh, are, of course, tax deductible, um, which a, um, a fee for the webinar would not be. So uh, we appreciate your support and um, really cannot do the work without that. So I'm going to turn this over to our new executive director, Craig Burke who will uh, moderate the uh, Q&A period. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Well, yes, hi, everyone. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Inez. Thank you, Ellen. And thank you all for joining us. So we have a few minutes, minutes here for questions. Uh, we are going to try to wrap up promptly at the at turn of the hour. Uh, as we know, you all have other things to get to. And so we'll dive right into some questions here that you've been sending us. The most pressing question we've been receiving is, are these handouts available? And they are. Um, if you can see the um, website, the ESI website here, ellensatterinstitute.org, um, you can go there and click on the webinars button. And under that tab, whoop, under that tab, there is a webinars handouts link. You can click there, and you will find the handouts you're looking for from today right there on top. It's a PDF file for your download, and we hope that helps you on that. So, other questions. Um, why don't we start with Z with the Z-score? There were several questions around that. So, um, Ellen and Inez, perhaps you could recap what a Z-score score is, how it's calculated and any tips for helping that information be useful for, for uh, clinicians, parents, helping them understand that information? Wow, you don't want much, do you, Craig? Um. <laughs> well, let's unpack that. So how about a Okay, no, it's tackle? okay. I'll, I'll tackle this. Um, okay. Not too long ago, I wrote, well, it's probably quite a while now, I wrote a a family meals focus about Z scores. So if you go to um, www.ellensatter.com and go to family meals focus um, and click on that and then scroll down, you're going to see, in fact, stop, 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 um, and one of your handouts for today's webinar. What am I doing? I'm working way too hard here. Family Meals Focus, number 66. You can see it on the ESI screen uh, that talks about handouts, understanding and using Z-scores to track children's growth. So that, I think, is a short answer to what you are asking. Uh, and something else, uh, Craig, while you're, um, you're moving your uh, cursor around, that, no, go back to where you were with the handouts. Oh, thank okay, you. Okay, sure. All right, you're, you're just going. 
uh, way in advance of me. So that's great. So now scroll up and see where it says dub dub dub. Clin is BB3 host. It's right under everybody's names. There, there. That's mm -hmm. uh, that's what Inez was telling you earlier in the presentation. And this is where you can go to post questions and have discussion related to the content of the um, of today's webinar. So here I am stopping talking and giving Inez a chance to answer some questions. I think it's great that um, it be even more great if more clinicians, and now notice I'm saying clinicians, not researchers, begin to, to calculate z-scores. Um, the, the CDC website is a little bit um, disingenuous in the way that they recommend to um, it seems the instructions are so easy to be able to calculate these scores. It is not that easy, but it's not impossible either. So um, what I recommend is that if you are so inclined to learn how to do it and begin to do it at your clinic, you can email me and then I'll tell you um, instructions on, on how to do it. It's not, again, not very difficult, but it, it's, it's involved like everything that has some value, I guess. You have to work a little bit at, at getting it, but it, it's absolutely um, music to my ears to hear that more people will want to do, to do this. Excellent. Um, there were several questions about whether the children in the studies, the babies in the studies, were breastfed or formula fed. Can you speak to that? Okay. The, the study by um, most of the studies, there's no information as to how the babies were fed. Uh, fed. This is why um, whenever it was Rec, uh, mentioned like in the study by Singal, the two studies by Singal, um, then I mentioned it. Um, and again, the, the, in the study where, is, where this is more prominently discussed is in the study, in the study that he conduct, uh, published in 2003 um, with those, those 106 and 110 and 61 babies, those three groups of babies that, um, that um, he published it as a randomized controlled trial. Um, and again, then I ask if the babies had, you know, how, how were the breastfed babies randomized, and, and the, then the answer was they were not. Okay, thank you. Next question here says, a pediatrician in my clinic uses the term channeling to describe an early window of time in infancy when a child grows rapidly, a normal phenomenon in other words, and then finds their steady weight gain. Is, is that a thing? Is channeling a thing? Um, or is that unhealthy rapid weight gain? In the um, Family Meals Focus, number 77, um, catch-up growth, um, go down a little farther, Craig, and you can point to it. Um, in the article that I just wrote about catch-up growth, you can, uh, you'll see me referring to channeling. And what it refers to is a child following a particular growth trajectory. And you know, when we looked at Adele, she kind of crossed, uh, she crossed percentiles, but she was sort of doing her own little channeling, and then she eventually settled down around the 95th percentile. And so, uh, yeah, channeling is a normal thing, and it simply has to do with trusting the child to grow in a in their own uh, and you know reasonably uh, consistent way, even though uh, the, the integrity of their growth is many times an internal one. Excellent. So I think um, how about one more question here, um, and I'll make it twofold to so try to combine two questions. One question asks if there were any studies where the parents' weight was included in the research, and a similar question was around. Um, the role of race or ethnicity in respect to early weight gain? Okay, those are two good questions. And um, yes, the ethnicity was considered in the studies by Stettler. And, um, and uh, the, then the other answer is no. Most of the times uh, the parents, and some of them, the mother's weight was, was um, included. The father's weight, for some reason, has consistently shown that it's not related at all um, to early infant weight gain. Okay. Well, we're sorry we can't get to all your questions here, but we are at the top of the hour. 
Um, and we thank you all for joining us. And um, we hope you will join us again next week. Yes, and Craig, um, they can hang on to their questions and ask them next week, or they can go to the Clinical Issues Bulletin Board and ask them there. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you.